Hello, my loves. This is Raw. Welcome back. Today, I want to talk about being in the closet, how, <laughs> I guess it's an elephant in the room, how I am so in the closet about my relationship at work and with certain extended family members, yet I am all over YouTube and all over the internet as the face of strong prison wives and families. And then also I want to talk through with you when I feel it's appropriate to share and when I feel it's appropriate to stay in the closet, not talk about it. And if and how I believe that you're betraying your loved one, I had a talk with Adam about this and I think that I can pass along some advice to help you feel better if you don't like to talk about it too much. So first I want to start with a story. Actually, first I'll start with why I'm in a hotel room right now. I am actually supposed to be at visit. It is Sunday morning around 11 o'clock. And unfortunately, the facility went on lockdown last night. So I had visit for a couple of hours. Yesterday, Adam's mother went in early. I had to wind up crashing her weekend because I'm going to see a concert in Pittsburgh. So had I not had plans to go to that concert, which I got last minute, it was awesome. I'll tell you guys about that on another video. I might do a vlog about the concert. Adam's mom had planned to go Father's Day weekend. I had planned to come this weekend. If it was any other weekend and I didn't have plans, I would have easily just switched my weekend. I don't have kids or anything really that I have to schedule around. So I schedule around her considering she's coming all the way from Wisconsin and she only comes once a year. Unfortunately, I had this and she was so sweet. And she said, you can come anytime throughout my visit. I said, listen, I can come one day or the other. I can leave early and come late some days. I want to give you alone time with your son. And that's a lesson that I talked about on Instagram, but I also want to pass along with you guys here. Don't be selfish with that. Sons need time with their mothers. Sons need time with their fathers or their own daughters and sons and don't be selfish and take all of their visits away from them it's totally fine you don't have to have FOMO about visit so what I did was yesterday I went in late I went in after count so they will process from 8 in the morning until 9 o'clock and then they shut it down until about 10 45 because there was a 9 o'clock or 9 45 10 o'clock I don't remember exactly even though I've been doing this for so long count I slept in a little bit I took my time getting ready I actually felt great by the time I got there because I wasn't rushing I got to sleep in and then I was processed I gave Adam and his mom a few hours alone and then I came in so everything seemed fine when we left we didn't think twice about it unfortunately there was a fight in the chow hall where they eat Last night they got locked down and they canceled visit for today. Normally I just would have gotten in the car and driven home, but instead I went to the diner with Adam's mom before she headed out. She's driving to Buffalo so she could fly back. And then one of my girlfriends that I stayed with and I came back to the hotel for a few minutes and I'm wasting time until I have to drive to Pittsburgh for the concert because my friend had stuff to do this morning and this afternoon. So let's start with the story time. Back when I first got in touch with Adam, I was feeling as if I wanted to sing it from the rooftops. I was in this new relationship. I loved him. He was amazing. He treated me wonderfully. He was very attractive. He was very, very intelligent. And I just felt like I wanted to talk about it all the time. So I went out to a happy hour with one of my girlfriends one night and I drank a little bit too much. And this guy started hitting on us and he was talking to us. And we went outside at the time again, I was smoking. So we went outside for a cigarette and he started talking and he asked me if I was single. And I said, no. And he said, well, then where's your boyfriend? Kind of being a typical guy. And I said, well, I had in a second in my head, I'm like, do I tell him? Do I not tell him? I'm like, this is kind of cool and edgy and he's a bad boy. Cause remember this was so long ago. I said, he's in Allenwood. And he said, isn't that a prison? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, I'm a cop. I think he was a detective. He said, that's really disturbing because that's a really high security penitentiary. So he must have done something really bad. And my friend pulled me out of there. She said, we're leaving now. And we left and she, in the car, she said, you might not want to tell that to people all the time. I know you're in a relationship and I know you're happy, but really that could have, if you were alone, gotten you into a really bad situation because he was one of those aggressive guys that wasn't taking no for an answer. Well, where's your boyfriend if you really have one? What if I wasn't here to pull you out of that situation? You don't have to tell everybody all the time. Sometimes it's better to stay quiet about things. Well, ironically, that same friend, probably about a year later, was driving to visit and she got pulled over and the cop stopped her. And he goes, you're flying. She was doing 90 something miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. And he said, where are you going? And she said, Ugh. she said she had the same thought, like, well, my boyfriend's more badass than this cop that pulled me over. And she goes, I'm going to visit my boyfriend. And he said, where is he? And she said, USP Allenwood. And he looked at her and he threw the book at her, gave her every ticket that he possibly could. And he made some really condescending comment because here's the thing, at the end of the day, he might be a big bad 
guy in Allen would, but the cops don't want the power. And how is he going to protect you from behind a wall that he can't leave? So those are two, I want to say opposite, but they're not. They're two stories of times that you probably just don't want to share. The last thing I would tell a cop when I was pull, being pulled over is that I was where I was going because that's subjecting me to my car being searched, to them retaliating against my criminal husband on me. It's just better sometimes to keep your mouth shut. I took this class on grief and coping for prison wives and family members a few years ago. And in this class, the professor, Dr. Avon Hart Johnson, who runs DC Project Connect, it's an organization very similar to Storm Prison Wives and Families where they provide support to people getting out of prison and inmates, especially female inmates in a halfway house in Washington, DC. However, Dr. Johnson is a therapist and she does grief counseling and she has all of these degrees, her, her PhD and certifications in counseling and grief counseling. So we work closely together because I don't have, aside from her, anybody that does that for me for strong prison wives. I don't have anybody to do that full time. So usually if I have somebody in crisis, I will send them to her directly. So when she put together this class and taught it, I was part of the pilot. And in there, she said, there are three reasons that you might want to share this with somebody. And every other time, you don't owe it to anybody. You, sh you are more than welcome to stay in the closet. The first, she calls them the three E's, which will make this easy for you to remember. The first is if you want to empower somebody. So let's say at the prisoner family conference, I'm up on stage and I'm giving my talk. Side note commercial, you could still register. It's early registration right now for the Prisoner Family Conference, which will be held in October. I think it's the first or second week in October. It is amazing. I, got, I went in 2016, I went in 2018. A whole bunch of us went from Strong Prison Wives. Even more people plan to go this year. It's basically our meetup. We will have a meetup room there. It is in Dallas. And I thoroughly encourage you to go. I'll be giving a keynote speech. Nicole will be reading her poetry. And Lisanne will also be giving a keynote about what she went through losing her loved one on the inside due to medical negligence. So I want to get on stage. And during my keynote, I use my strength and my experiences to make you be able to find your own voice. And I talk about how we advocate for our loved ones and it riles you up and it gets you motivated to leave there and be the advocate that you need to be to find your voice, to go advocate for your loved one or all of your loved one, but all of the people who are suffering under an unfair law or something unjust at the facility, you're empowered to go do that. So I can use my experience to fuel you, to rile you up, to get you going and make you find your inner fire. Or very simply, I use these videos to say, hey, he is 213 years and I can be this positive. Genuinely, I can feel so optimistic about it. If I can do it, sweetheart, with 213 years, so can you. I am empowering you to find your inner strength or I'm helping you empower yourself to light that fire and go. The second time that you wanna do this is to educate somebody. The best example I heard about this was my friend Lauren, who you hear me talk about on live video all the time. She's down in Florida. The first year in 2016, when we went to that same conference I was talking about, she was leaving and she was flying from Dallas back home to Florida. And on the plane, she sat next to this man who was asking her, where were you? Where are you coming back from? Where are you going to someplace? And she said, I'm on my way home from Dallas. He said, in Dallas, what were you doing? And she explained, I was at the prisoner family conference. And he started asking her questions because she did it in his mind with his preconceived notions. She didn't appear to be the prison wife that he always thought, the stigma that he had developed in his own brain. And they talked for the whole entire, I don't know how long, three hour flight back to Florida. And she educated him on laws and how at the time her loved one was getting out four years early because of this unfair drug law that they wound up minimizing and giving guys a whole bunch of time back. It was drugs minus two back in the day. And when they landed, he said to her, wow, he said, you really educated me. So if you can use your experience to teach somebody about law or injustice of the system, or even another sister about what you go through while you're in visit and help her all along, absolutely use it. It's empower, it's educate. And then the third one is to empathize. So as we all know, one in a hundred people is directly affected by incarceration, but one in every two people 
has a loved one or eventually will have a loved one who a loved one in their circle of people who will wind up faced with incarceration because mass incarceration is an epidemic in our country at this point. So I was in a meeting one time at work. And people were talking about joking how work is our jail cell and how they used to call it cell block 154 because 154, this is made up, so don't <laughs> try to find my office, but cell block 154 because let's say 154 was the address of my building, which it's not, by the way. So let's say that a woman gets up and she is very offended because she has a loved one who's in prison. And I can tell you, this did happen to me one time, except I stayed quiet and I was getting offended. Like if you guys only knew. I hope that you thank your lucky stars every single day that this is your perceived cell block. Yeah, rules suck. Yeah, micromanaging is the worst thing. I am part of being micromanaged. I get it, but it is light years better than being incarcerated than what my loved one has to go through. But, and I felt that twinge, but I didn't say anything. If one in two people are affected by it and there are 10 people in this room, five of those people will be affected by it. So she just insulted half of that room, the person who's taunting and making fun of prisoners. So let's say one of those five people gets up and says, hey, I'm affected by it. You're insulting me. I could afterwards pull her out of the room to the side and say, listen, I feel your pain so badly. My husband is serving 213 years. I totally understand. I'm here for you to lean on, to vent to. I can, even though I'm in the closet at work, divulge that information because I'm empathizing with her. I want her to know that I genuinely understand what she's going through and I genuinely feel her pain and I genuinely was as hurt as she was in that meeting. So educate, empower, and empathize. Those are the three times. Every other time, you guys, you do not owe it to him. You are not betraying him if you're not saying anything. In the beginning, I was really scared because I said to him in a visit one time, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm betraying you. And if you feel as if I am and I should be open about it because then I would be not betraying you, then let me know and I'll work on it. And he said, absolutely not. He said, you need to do what makes you comfortable out there. I'm not out there to help you and to protect you. Just like that time in the bar with that cop or the time with my friend getting pulled over and announcing where she was going. They're not there to protect us. They're stuck. And if something happens to us, that is their biggest fear. And that is their biggest regret is not being able to be here to help us. So if you need to be in the closet to protect yourself or just make yourself feel less anxious going through the motions of life, I don't care. You're not betraying me. You don't owe it to anybody to tell them anything about your personal life. Here's the thing. Would you ever walk into work in the morning and expect your boss to come to you and say, hey, can you come in my office? And you walk in the office and them say to you, I had a really bad fight with my husband last night. We're actually going to get a divorce. That's not your business. And I don't think you ever, ever would be pulled into that. Just because your relationship is not according to somebody else, mainstream or traditional or conventional does not mean it's open for you to have to discuss, to be ridiculed about, or for anybody to give their opinion on you. Back when I used to compete in fitness, I would have to get down to a certain body fat percentage. At that point, after my competitions, I would get back to a normal, healthy body fat percentage because Contrary to popular belief, the body fat that you have to be to stand on the stage and get your physique assessed and you look like the epitome of health is actually very unhealthy for a woman to be that low in body fat. 10 to, thir 10 to 13 percent is really low for a woman. That's when you go into amenorrhea, which is when you don't menstruate anymore. You're too low body fat and your body actually is protecting itself because it's not healthy enough to carry a baby. I would compete at 8 percent. So according to people who didn't understand that, I looked like the epitome of health, but then afterwards I would gain weight back so I was healthy. I only can live there at a certain amount of time. I would only be down there for two weeks of my life and then the other 50 weeks of the year, I had to be healthy. And people didn't understand that. All they saw was me go to, from this quote unquote ideal physique that was nowhere near ideal to a normal body. but gaining that much weight that fast, I had somebody say to me, oh my God, you were this big last week. And today 
you're like this, literally puffed out her cheeks like that to the point where I started crying because emotionally that wasn't healthy for me either. And that's some of the reason why I stopped doing it. Point is, I had people tell me, wow, you got a gut now. The fitness girl got fat. You name it, they talked about it. Just because I competed on a stage never, ever gave anybody any validation to comment on my physique. Because here's the thing, if any normal normal person who didn't compete gained five pounds, nobody would say that to them. If they lost five pounds, nobody would comment about it. You don't talk about somebody's body. Just because I get on stage does not give you permission to comment on my physique. Same thing, just because my relationship is not in line with what you think is normal or acceptable or conventional or traditional does not give you any validation or right. It does not make my relationship any less than yours. So the point is you do not ever need to justify yourself or feel as if you owe it to somebody to tell them about your personal life. It is personal for a reason. If somebody at work starts asking you questions, all you have to say is, I'm sorry, I don't talk about my personal life at work. And that's it. So here's the biggest elephant that I want to address that I get the most questions on. I am the founder of Strong Prison Wives and Families, a hundred thousand member community. My face is all over the internet. I am trying my damnedest to grow my YouTube channel to be as big and to match that number of that community because I want to reach as many people as I can reach. Yes, I'm still in the closet with people. So how does that even work? Here's the thing. Now, this might sound very naive. It might sound very stupid, but it is how I choose to live every day of my life. When I was confronted about my YouTube channel at work a few years ago, and I pulled all of my videos down for quite a few years until I came back this past July, about a year ago, full force on YouTube, I played small. And I always knew in my gut that I was given this mission in life. I can be a voice for so many people who need me to speak for them. I can be here to support so many people who can't, who don't feel like they can get through another day where I've been doing this for close to 20 years and I have it so much worse than them. If they have two years and they don't know how they're gonna get through it, they can look to me and I can lead by my example. I did this for so long, alone, sad, scared, anxious that I know that I was put on this planet to use my voice. So here's what I said. I threw up my white flag and I said, if this is what I am meant to do, this is what I'm going to do. And I just need the universe or God, or you insert, I hate throwing around words that are going to trigger people or cause I have my own scars about that. And I can't wait to do my best friend tag so you can really understand the scars that we went through in our youth. And that's all I'm gonna say. Hopefully that video is coming soon. She just has three young kids and it's really hard to coordinate our schedules because they're all in sports and she's a teacher, etc. But I have my own scars. So whatever you believe in, don't get tripped up in words. But I put it out there that if this is what I'm meant to do, then allow me to do this and stay protected and allow me to do this and keep those two lives separate. And if one day somehow they cross because I've had people say that's so stupid and that's so naive and you're setting yourself up for that. Well, I know that if this is what I'm meant to do, that somehow all the pieces will fall into place and I will be able to pick up my pieces from there. And I'll be able to pivot and move forward and go from there, just reassess and reevaluate my situation. So that's all I want to say. But the lesson that I really want to pass along to you is that you don't owe it to anybody to talk about your relationship. And the advice that I gave to one of my friends is to develop a cover story. And this is not, it might be omitting facts, but you have to do what's going to protect yourself. So my girlfriend, Joe's husband was in Oregon and he was taking classes. So when she was going through trying to figure out staying in the closet, and protecting herself, I said, well, why don't you tell people that your husband is on scholarship in Oregon, taking classes, and he'll be home in 2020. And until then, you live apart. He is in Oregon. He is taking college classes, and he did get a scholarship. He will also be home in 2020. She's not making anything up. She's just using that story to protect herself. I used to tell people all the time, my husband lives in Pennsylvania because he works with a college professor. They facilitate classes together and they're going to write a book together and he's working on that until he can come home. None of that is a lie. Every single thing happened. Every single thing is the truth. I just admit the little part about 
where he's facilitating those classes and how he's doing all of the above. And that's okay, you guys, protect yourself. I don't condone lying, but in this instance, I condone staying safe because at the very least, if you're telling people that your loved one is gone, especially a man that's hitting on you and is not taking no for an answer, essentially what you're saying is, I sleep alone at night, I live alone, you need to stay safe, my love. And if that means conducting a story and in omitting some of the truth and even bending some of the facts, girl, you do it because I don't want to hear any stories about how somebody was at risk because they felt guilty, not saying where their loved one was or they felt like they were behave betraying or they felt like they were betraying their loved one. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you disagree, that's cool, comment below. I love to get an educated conversation going about this. I'd love to know your thoughts on it because this is a, one that people really, really struggle with. Comment below, make sure you like this video. It's a free way that you can help me out. And also if you're new here, welcome. Make sure you hit that little subscribe button below so you never miss a video. My content I feel is so important to help get you through and that's why I do what I do. That's what I'm here for. Keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to it all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart to yours. I will see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys.